Hey everybody, it's Anna and welcome back to my booktube channel. If you've made it to this video and you're watching it, congratulations. We are making it through this pandemic one day at a time. And I just want to tell everybody watching this that I'm really proud of you for making it this far. These are some really difficult and frankly unprecedented times that we're going through right now. And I hope that you all are doing your best to take good care of yourselves, you know, make sure that you uh, take appropriate precautions for your own health and safety and the health and safety of those people around you. And just know that if you're watching this, somebody's thinking about you and wishing you well. So with all that being said, I would like to go ahead and present to you my Geekly wrap up for the week of March 16th through March 22nd. This was marking the third week, I believe, that uh, we've been sort of like quarantine self-isolation type stuff. And as I'm making this video, the governor of Washington state, which is where I live, is possibly going to issue a statewide shelter in place tonight. So I, as usual, have spent a lot of time indoors and just reading and cuddling with my dogs and playing Animal Crossing. This week I uh, sorely tested my capabilities to not read anything with super serious subject matter for the month of March, and so to that end I finished reading three books, one graphic novel, I DNF'd one book, and I played two board games. So we will go ahead and get into that. So the first book that I finished is actually one of the last books that I bought before everything sort of shut down and that is The Fire Goes The Fire Never Goes Out a memoir in pictures by Noelle Stevenson. So you probably know her if you read comics. She's the author and creator of the Nimona graphic novel of the Lumberjane series and most recently um, she's the showrunner and creator of She Ra and the Princesses of Power which is an animated show on Netflix and this is the story of her life as told in pictures. Um, it's a story about the types of things within her that have stayed the same throughout the years and the parts of her that have changed. And I found this book to be so incredibly moving. There are so many similarities between myself and Noelle Stevenson, whether it's growing up in a really religious household, the sort of anger and confusion and frustration of being closeted as a young kid and being insistent that you're not queer, that you know you can fit into this sort of box that's been expected of you since you were really little, and also just like dealing with some intense mental health stuff. This book does come with some trigger warnings for depictions of self-harm and the more like serious episodes of her bouts with bipolar disorder, and she draws that um, I think extraordinarily well and extraordinarily powerfully. So just be aware of that. It's not too much and it isn't too much on the page, but um, I thought that I would mention that anyway. I gave this book five out of five stars. It was really interesting reading this as somebody that has been following Noel Stevenson's career since Nimona. I didn't read it as a webcomic, but I read it when it came out as a book. And basically just seeing somebody who's very close in age to me, I think we're like exactly the same age. And I remember like just watching her star rise and being so jealous and wishing that like I could have that and I could be like that. And her writing in this book is all about the fear that came with watching that happen to her so young. Like she was so young and she had this like meteoric, unprecedented success that was just ridiculous like how quickly it all happened and she was just really waiting for the other shoe to drop so it really gave me some interesting perspective on one of my favorite writers and artists and like what was actually going on behind the scenes with her at the time that she was creating what are still some of my absolute favorite pieces of media ever so if you're at all interested in graphic memoir noelle stevenson stories about mental health stories about growing up queer um i would highly recommend this book it was fantastic all right a lot of people um have been keeping progress with my rereading of the redwall series i finished this week the bell maker which is by brian jakes of course and this is the seventh book in the redwall series the redwall series being the stories of these warrior mice that decided to retreat from battle and retreat from a life of violence in order to create a monastery for peace where creatures could all live in harmony. They call it a monastery, but there isn't like a religion per se. Um, 
in this book series. If anything, like the main thing is their their legendary hero Martin the Warrior, and like the sort of folklore and and, and folk tales that get passed down among the different animals from generation to generation. So this one is a sort of swashbuckling sea adventure that is about Joseph the Bellmaker, who is not really a fighter. He's not a warrior mouse. He has a daughter who's a warrior mouse, but he is the one that casts the great bell that resides inside of Redwall Abbey, and he has to go on an adventure to help rescue and save um, basically some deposed squirrel royalty because there are some foxes that have come in and are kind of messing up the ecosystem or whatever. I love these books because I love the stories of really small creatures that against all odds are able to overcome extremely threatening and menacing challenges, which is always timely, really, but just feels especially, like, I don't know, soothing to read about right now. Also, the food descriptions in this book are to die for. Anybody that's read this series will tell you, you just start salivating as you read stuff from the book. So I ended up giving that one four out of five stars. Next, I read a book that I absolutely couldn't stand. It wasted my time, and in what I think is a first for this channel, actually, I gave it one star, and that is The Blacksmith Queen by G.A. Aiken. Now, let me give you a little backstory on this book. I found out about this because somebody that was from the romance book club that I have been going to uh, mentioned that this was like a previous, um, a previous read that the book club had done, and when they found out that I really like reading science fiction and fantasy, they were like, oh, maybe you'll like this. So I picked it up, and I was like, okay, this sounds kind of like cheesy and tropey. Like the first sentence of the book is literally, the old king is dead, and old king are with, spelled with capital letters. And I was like, okay, I could, I could get into this. And I really just wasn't sure what to make of this book at first because it really did not take itself seriously at all to the point where I wasn't sure if the book was just bad or if the writing was intentionally bad, kind of as a joke. And then we got to the point where I began to realize that I thought that the love interest was going to be a horse, an actual horse. And I wasn't I was kind of confused by this and I wasn't entirely too far off the mark because the love interest in this book is part of this like wandering uh, band of centaurs and they like shift back and forth between their human form and their like equine centaurian form. Which again like is not something that sounds like it would be bad except for the fact that this book was written so poorly that the characters I mean, I, I hesitate to even call them characters because they were kind of like little wooden spoons with googly eyes glued on them. They just had no personality. They had no depth, development, anything whatsoever. It really seemed like they were just swept up in this plot that was like if a JRPG video game had a baby with the sort of like violence and crassness of a Tarantino movie and then they gave birth to this book. And not in a good way. This was not really good at all. I did not really get a strong sense of who any of the characters were, what their motivations were, what they wanted. The romance was non-existent. I was like, maybe this is just going to be a really trashy romance. I mean, there's like one sex scene that goes on for a page at the very end of the book, but there's no relationship between the main character and the love interest really whatsoever beyond, you know, mere physical proximity. And this was just plain bad. I honestly could not recommend it. I'm sorry if this is your favorite book ever, but you know, different strokes for different folks. And also, congratulations on witnessing this historic moment because I don't think I've ever given a book one star on my channel before. Usually I would save that for something that's just like outright offensive, not just like the book was bad, but this was so bad that it was honestly kind of offensive to me. All right, and then the last book that I finished was really good. It was one of the books that Erin gave me for my birthday, and that is Roll With It by Jamie Sumner. So if you watched my birthday book haul, you'll know that this is a book about a girl named Ellie, and she has cerebral palsy and uses a wheelchair, and she has uh, this dream that she wants to become a professional baker. And this is kind of like her story of trying to fit in at a new middle school and make new friends, especially because she's like, when you're the kid in the wheelchair, oftentimes 
sometimes it's hard for people to see past that and she wants people to see her for more than just her disability. Like one thing I really appreciated about this book is that, you know, aside from some of the like negative effects of having CP, like obviously she doesn't like when her disability causes her physical pain or anything, but this book wasn't about Ellie overcoming disability and she was just fine with living the way that she was. You know, she wasn't trying to like seek out some magical cure or something. She didn't hate herself for being disabled. She was just a normal kid that had her dream of becoming a baker and then there were also some like disability related things in the book and I really liked that. She has two friends, one of whom is on the autism spectrum, at least it's hinted at that in the book. I thought he personally was a little bit less well drawn as a character. He definitely leaned a little bit more on some like tropey stereotypes of like how autism is often portrayed in literature where it's like, you know, speaking in a very robotic voice and taking everything extremely literally and it's like it's a stereotype because there is some truth to it, but also I feel like that character could have been fleshed out a little bit more beyond that stereotype, if that makes sense. One thing that I kind of was put off by with this book, honestly, like overall I really liked it. Like it was a three star read for me. I gave it a good rating. But one of the things that kind of put me off was the fact that sometimes Ellie and her friends don't talk like how 12 year olds actually talk. Like, they use the word handicapped a lot, and I have never heard a kid that's like 12 or under use that word. Like, that was definitely the terminology from my generation when I was really little, but I don't think that, like, kids today use the word handicapped. Like, I'm pretty sure people say disabled. And then there were definitely some times where Ellie would say something about, like, advocating at school or access needs or something like that, and I the rhetoric kind of like reminded me of something and I couldn't figure out what it was until I did some searching and I was like, oh, this reminds me of like the, the, you know, like if you go on the website, The Mighty, and you read these essays by like parents of disabled kids or whatever, and there's a particular tone to the rhetoric. And I was like, this 12 year old sounds like a parent that's advocating for a disabled kid nothing wrong with that. It was just weird hearing that come out of a 12 year old's mouth and then I did some googling. In fact, Jamie Sumner is the parent of a disabled kid. She has a son who has cerebral palsy and I was like, oh, okay, that's where that's coming from. But that read is very inauthentic to the way that a 12 year old would talk. Um, even a 12 year old that's, you know, very precocious and, and mature and stuff like that. That just did not seem to really fit with the rest of the characters. And the only other thing I have to say about this book is that there is, I guess, like a very at the tail end of the book content warning for one of her grandparents being in some danger. Um, a big part of this book is her her and her mom move in with their grandparent with the grandparents in order to help support them as Ellie's grandfather's Alzheimer's disease progresses. So they are trying to, you know, help take care of him and make sure that he's safe and their grandmother is safe and everything. And he is in some danger at the end of the book, but don't worry everything turns out okay. So those were all of the books. I also DNF'd a book this week because I'm trying to read things that are more uplifting and like don't contain super dark and serious subject matter for the month of March and I almost failed doing that but fortunately was able to DNF The Degenerates by J. Albert Mann which is kind of sad because it was one of my most anticipated releases but this is a book about the kind of like horrors of Mental, mental institutionalization in early 20th century America and it follows these four girls all of whom have been institutionalized for various reasons. One of them has Down syndrome, one of them has like a, a physical deformity on her foot. Um, some of the others are just like you know basically the criminal justice system is tired of dealing with them and is willing to uh, have them designated as morons very heavily in air quotes so that they get put in these institutions and out of the public eye. The thing about this book is I'm not really sure who it was written for because if you already know that the state of mental institutions in the early 20th century and like basically before the disability rights movement was bad, this book doesn't really give you anything new. Like none of the characters are particularly interesting or memorable in that sense. And you're not gonna learn anything new about how bad it was to live in one of these places back then. And if you don't know anything about how bad it was, I'm not sure that this book is necessarily the right thing to give you that idea because it contains a lot of really like 
ableist and racist language that is extremely outdated but was part of the like scientific designations of the time so like the scientific designation at the time for these girls was that they were all like classed as morons again heavily in air quotes and like graded on a scale of basically like irredeemably moronic to okay can sort of kind of be like a normal person again all heavily in air quotes and there's even more to it than that but just honestly as somebody that like would have ended up in one of these places had I lived back then I didn't really find this to be I don't know, particularly useful for me to read, you know, like, if I don't need the shock of learning how bad it really was, do I really need to go through and, like, read a book that contains all of this really, really offensive language? It wasn't for me, at least not at this time. I might pick it back up again, we'll see, because I am kind of curious to see what happens to some of the characters as they're, like, trying to escape from the place and trying to figure out what to make of their lives, but again, I'm not really sure who this book is. All right, and then in our fun social isolation times, Sean and I played a couple of board games together. We recently acquired Suburbia, the collector's edition, which I'm only holding up the lid of because this box is huge. It's like a 12 by 12, four foot, or sorry, four inch deep cube. And this is a tile laying game that is kind of like if you played SimCity ever, but as a board game. So you are basically taking turns drafting little tiles into your city, your neighborhood, and you can draft different types like business buildings, civic buildings, industry, residential, all of that stuff. And you're trying to organize it in a particular way in order to get the most points because that's how board games work. Um, the collector's edition just comes with a bunch of extra different expansions that add different tiles and like different challenge modes for the games and stuff like that, including some truly adorable little tiles that are based around board game conventions in real life. We've played this game twice. I won once and lost terribly the other time, and I am really enjoying it so far. It is a really big, hefty box, and it was expensive because let me tell you, there is a lot of cardboard in here, but if you're interested in stuff that sort of simulates city building, which is like one of my favorite genres of game ever, um, and then something that like, despite how crunchy and intense it looks, is actually not that heavy of a game. Like this is a pretty medium weight game. It's very easy to pick up and learn how to play and understand. There's a lot of text on the city tiles, so it can be a little bit overwhelming at first, but you get used to it really quickly. And then we played a very old favorite, Ex Libris. This is another sort of drafting game where you are drafting cards that have books on them into your library because you are a bunch of little like magic librarians that are competing to have the most prestigious library in the town. There is always a like genre of book that is the ideal one for you to have that gives you a bunch of bonus points and then there's a genre that's banned so you get negative points for every book of that genre you have. I crushed it playing this last night and it does play up to four. I would like when this is all over to play it at a higher player count because I think that the like player interaction opportunities would be a lot better than if you played it at just two but it was a lot of fun. I really like want this game to see a lot more play from my collection. And that is gonna do it for this week's Geekly Wrap Up. If you like what you saw here and you're interested in seeing more of what I do, go ahead and subscribe to my channel because that is the best way to get updates every time I post new videos, which is going to be pretty frequently considering that we are all pretty much staying at home for the foreseeable future. As always, thank you all so very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.